Привет, comrades! Today on Little Wars TV we will be refighting the final death throes of Nazi Germany and the spectacular representation of the central government district of Berlin. This year is the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Berlin. It was one of the largest battles of the Second World War. Over a million men larger than Stalingrad. But it's never achieved the same level of fame and attention. To find out why, we've invited a very special guest host to help set the stage and give some historical context for the battle. Historian David Lance is one of the world's leading experts on the Eastern Front. And he'll tell you about the final Soviet drive on Berlin why Stalin didn't simply bypass the city, and how the Germans made this final battle so costly and so bloody. After our interview with David Glantz, six players square off on this custom 6mm tabletop to see who among us will win the glory and the honor of raising the Soviet flag over the Reichstag. Spoiler alert, it will be me! Glory to the motherland! You've got to understand there's a level of desperation in Germany in February 45. <laughs> and for good reason. You have the bulk of, so of two Soviet fronts along the Oder Neisse River. And they aren't the kind of worn out fronts you had at the end of Soviet offensives earlier in the war. These are powerful forces with, with probably superiorities of 15 to 20 to 1. They had in this Vistal Oder operation, essentially, and the East Prussian operation, destroyed two more German army groups. German Army Group Center in uh, uh, East Prussia, gone from the map. Army Group Center, the new one, formed in Poland, and Army Group A, also remove, removed from the map. And, and basically, when I say removed from the map, the armies that defended no longer existed. They were simply encircled, annihilated, with the remnants fighting their way back. In the Vistal Oder operation, the tank armies have, are given orders, first and second for Zhukov, the third and fourth for Konyev. Go as deep as you can, and they'll go 700 kilometers deep, ending up on the Oder River right outside of Ber 30 kilometers from Berlin. The Germans essentially do a total mobilization, and they mobilize everybody, including the youth. And you've seen stories about, about the German 13 and 14 year olds heading to the front. They're scraping the bottom of the barrel. But one thing Germans do well is dig in, and they dig, they dig, and they dig, and they dig, and they bring in, they bring in Volkssturm units, uh, people's militia, they bring in line divisions, they, they do strip the West. Hitler decides to stay in his chancellery, he'll, he'll be there till the very end. It's going to be a Goddardammerung, a Wagnerian ending to this whole thing. So Stalin and most of the Soviet commanders view this as a, a ceremonial ending of the war, a fitting end for a dictator who ravaged the Soviet Union. And they're going to ravage Berlin. They're going to ravage it like it's never been ravaged before. And the hatred is so deep that you will even see competition between the Soviet commanders. Zhukov is advancing frontally, right into the lobe, as they call it, the forehead of the German defenses on the Seelof Heights. And he's doing things like and placing massive searchlights so you can actually conduct a night attack with armor in daylight. Uh, all sorts of new things that are going on. And Konyev and Zhukov will do things to one another to hinder them from reaching the prize first. Whereas Zhukov, when he hears that Third Guard Tank Army's forward detachments are approaching Berlin from the south, and his two tank armies are still mired in the mud of Zilov Heights, he orders his artillery penetration divisions, they do have massive artillery this, by this time of the war, to fire on the forward detachments of Third Guard's tank army and slow them down. I want to get to Berlin first. I can't have Konya do it. You see the kind of competition you get. And you get it probably in a hundred cases when you get into the Berlin fight itself. When, when the two pinzers come down, Rokossovsky's forces from the north, Konyes from the south, and Zhukov's finally working them their way through the Zilov Heights with tremendous casualties, and coming into the city itself, and then running into the city blocks and the canals that, that, uh, that track across Berlin. Now what you end up with is a meat grinder. 
and and to be honest, the Germans defending those buildings are not the Germans of 42 and 43. A lot of them are young. A lot of them don't have much more than small arms and Panzerfaust, if that. And and so it's it's an unequal fight. But in a city the size of Berlin, with the complexity of the rubble, the Allies rubbled lots of Berlin in its bombing range. The Germans learned in Stalingrad their number one mistake was to rubble the city before they attacked it. You don't do that. Well. Allied forces did, and the Soviets had to go through that rubble when they conducted the operations in the city. They had in the city, they had it, they had it ringed. Circles around the city, heaviest in the east, and the city itself divided into quadrants, into sections, quarters and then subquarters. And it required the, the Soviets to use the systematic building by building, block by block approach. You put a a couple of, uh, of heavy assault guns, maybe a heavy engineer tank in the middle of each road. You drive it down the road, you flank them by infantry to protect from the Panzerfaust coming out of windows. I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty intricate organization. It's a heck of a lot harder fight to take Berlin than, than the Soviets had anticipated. Uh, Hitler, as we know, holds out to the very end when this phantom army is supposed to come in from the west and rescue him. Of course, it never arrives because there was no army from the west. But uh, th that's essentially the, the framework of that, of that uh, massive operation. With casualties that are also Jacobian, it is, it is a large set-piece battle. It didn't need to occur, uh, but when it did occur, it, it symbolized what the Russians had been fighting for for four years. Why hasn't it received more? Because it probably didn't need to occur. Uh, there's no question that had, had they done a simple envelopment operation, they could have encircled Berlin, probably gone further west. Now, by this time, they'd already agreed where the demarcation line between Allied forces would be. Uh, but uh, as I said, this is a Gotterdammerung for the Red Army, as well as for the Germans. And they consider they've earned the right to crush Berlin. A huge thank you to David Lance for giving us so much of his time so generously. And actually what you saw here was only a small segment of a much longer interview he did with us. We spoke to Colonel Lance at his office for almost 90 minutes. And patrons of our channel can listen to the entire unedited interview exclusively on our premium podcast, Little Wars FM. To play today's 75th anniversary battle, we are playing on the stunning 6mm recreation of Berlin. And guess what? We at Little Wars TV didn't make it. Hello, I'm Aaron Jenkins and I'm from Project Wargaming and this is my board. You may remember seeing Aaron in an earlier video when we met him at a HMGS convention last year. He won an award for his spectacular D-Day table, and we've stayed in touch ever since. Aaron, thanks for bringing your table all the way to our club for today's game. Happy to do it. I've seen lots of your episodes and certainly enjoyed them, and I think at this point it's time to kick you out so I can divide you into teams. So we should leave now? Yes. We're using a modified version of a channel favorite, Fistful of Toes. I saw the Little Wars TV guys using these rules in their Karakov episode a couple years ago, and I couldn't resist picking up a copy to try on my own. I've made some tweaks, basically using the simplified version you can find online for free at the Fistful of Toes website. Also, you can find uh, some of the models that I have created on my own website at projectwargaming.com. A lot of these other buildings come from uh, a company called WOW, they're all 3D printed. Uh, you can also find free stuff in the sections at littlewarstv.com. All right, let's meet our team so we can refight the Reichstag 75 years later. Okay, so uh, the situation for me is that I am in the, uh, the far corner uh, directly across from the Reichstag and uh, government buildings. This is a tough spot. Uh, we're gonna have to force a, a river crossing on a bridge. Um, and perhaps I may think uh, to entertain the possibility of uh, machine gunning a few of Miles' troops uh, later in the game. 
All right, I'm encouraged with the setup. I've got Chow on my left. He's gonna waste all his ammunition trying to shoot my troops. My guys are much smarter than his. We're gonna do fine. Uh, I'm gonna attack into the center and send my armor through the park to sweep around and take the, uh, take the memorials and then figure out where it goes from there. I'll be uh, leading my troops between Miles and Tony. Miles, I'm not going to worry too much about. Uh, I want to capture the church, then head out into the open with my armored forces and, and go for the victory tower. And then also I want to spend some time doing something I've wanted to do for a long time, and that's shoot Tony. I am on glorious right flank of Russian offensive. Comrade Stefan has already explained that he plans to capture all of the victory objectives for himself. Uh, you know, if his troops get too close... Uh... Uh, I've never played Fistful of Toes. I have actually read the first five pages of the rule book, so it makes me uniquely qualified to be a German defender of Berlin, as the Volkssturm didn't exactly have a lot of experience. The way the board is set up in this scenario, I don't know if we'll be able to coordinate ourselves much in the midst of the battle. I think we're both just going to be hanging on to the ground that we're holding, and that's about it. Yeah, there's a pretty big open area that I think is going to be a killing zone, so I intend to stay out of that. The four Soviet players deploy their troops along one edge of the table. They each start in their own designated jump-off areas, and there are special scenario rules that can result in friendly fire between Soviet formations. Each Red Army player is given the exact same force composition, with every round base of figures representing roughly a platoon of infantry or vehicles. These are 6mm miniatures from GHQ. I've also given all players a convenient quick reference sheet with all of their unit abilities and information. I've also given them plenty of burned out tank markers that I 3D printed. The white pipe cleaners you see here are temporary, used to show each Soviet player where they're allowed to deploy initially. The German players begin with less than half as many troops, mixed between elite SS formations and poorly trained Volkstrom. The Germans can begin the game by each deploying six pop-up ambush markers. Half of them are dummies and half are real. These markers can be deployed anywhere on the table. And from the outset, Dave wants to use his ambushes aggressively. As far as the hidden deployment, uh, you know, it's like how risky do you act with those troops? One of the Russian objectives is actually that church on my half of the board and literally they could step across the line and have that mm -hmm. so I, I i don't know if it's going to be worth it but i'm going to try i'm going to put a couple of my ambush markers in there just to create a little bit of havoc right from the start yeah that makes sense i mean when the the deck is stacked against us we might as well be risky and make, take those chances well worst case scenario i'll let the animals out of the zoo <laughs> The Zoo Flag Tower is just one of ten objectives in this game. Dave will also need to defend the Control Tower, the Main Road Exit, the Victory Column, and the Church. Simon is responsible for protecting the Reichstag, the Kroll Opera House, the Ministry Quarter, and two lesser statues in the Tear Garden. The Soviets have just eight turns to capture any six of these objectives today. Steve opens turn one exactly as Dave predicted pushing his infantry toward the church objective. As the Russian submachine gun troops infiltrate the church, they're met by ferocious resistance. Dave's early gamble to take a forward deployment pays off, and the Volkstrom delay Steve's advance. On the Soviet flank, Tony's tank columns pour out into the open, expecting an easy advance along the abandoned canal. But Dave's heavy tanks are dug in on the other side of the park, and their long-range fire is devastating. We're going to shoot here. Uh, six! Oh! Mm. Ah! King Tiger, um, two sixes, these are SS troops. four quality so checks. Oh, and they're leaving. On the opposite flank, Chow is struggling to even exit his deployment area. Simon trains his artillery and heavy guns from the Reichstag building to rain fire down on the Molke and Crown Prince bridges. Within just two turns, half of Chow's armor is on fire. The only Soviet player with something to smile about in the first two turns is the man in the middle, Miles. 
With the German defenders concentrating their efforts to shore up the flanks, Miles faces no opposition crossing his bridge and driving deep into the tear garden. By the start of turn three, Miles faces a critical decision in the center. Does he turn left toward Steve and the victory column to cut behind Dave's vulnerable forward defenses, or should he turn right to gobble up the easy objectives around the Kroll Opera House? Miles turns right, choosing to focus on his half of the board. This decision leaves Steve on his own to battle for the church, and it proves to be a costly objective indeed. It's not until the end of turn three when Steve finally celebrates seizing control. <laughs> but it's cost him a considerable amount of time and a third of his infantry. Turn 3 sees plenty of fireworks around the Reichstag as well. Chow's remaining T-34 85s are decimated, but they provide enough covering support to help his infantry cross into the Ministry Quarter and drive out Simon's Volkstrom. The Germans fall back into the ruins of the Kroll Opera House, where Miles and Chow concentrate every Russian off-table battery they can call to pummel that building. They're both flipped over, 203 is not flipped over. All right. Over. You said all three of these are no, not good. Two, yeah, both, both the golf boards are flipped, but not the 203. Uh, yeah, I think you're gonna get five. All right. But he's uh, reduced. Light cover, so it's a 15. Yep, by... and they are in the hard ones. So, so they're suppressed, check, six, six plus quality check. So yep. five, six. So, so here, automatically right. gets a quality check, and then I want to see if they destroy it. Coordinated fire from Miles and Chow fails to clear the opera house but does pin down Simon's defenders and limit his ability to maneuver. On the other half of the table, Comrade Steve and Comrade Tony do not share the same spirit of cooperation. Rather than providing much needed covering fire to support each other's advance, they focus on individual honors. Steve's troops secure the victory column in the middle of the table, leaving Tony's tanks to advance alone across the open ground toward the zoo flak tower. Heavy fire decimates his tanks as they make that approach. To be fair, I designed this scenario to keep the Soviets from helping each other too much. Not only are they competing for individual glory, the Germans are given random cards each turn, generating pop-up units. These cards often come up empty, but on the turns when Dave or Simon get a new unit, they aggressively place their units behind Soviet lines, forcing all four players to peel off reserves to shore up their rear areas. By the midpoint of the game, the Germans have every reason to feel good about their aggressive defensive strategy. It has been very bloody, uh, a lot of Russian dead. <laughs> I have destroyed an entire battalion of uh, SMG troops. I've destroyed two battalions of tanks, each running out of tanks. Um, that open area creates a kill zone where his armor just can't get across, but in the process I did finally lose two tigers. What about those those cards? So we've had these uh, cards that we've been revealing every turn and it's given us maybe nothing or maybe an SS unit, maybe even a tank. How have you been using those? Uh, I've only gotten two cards so far. Uh, one was a dug-in panther which I put where my tiger had been destroyed, which was helpful to kind nice. of stem that. The other one I had uh, a small group of SS guys that I actually had pop up behind him. Hmm. And they assaulted his 230 millimeter howitzer and destroyed <laughs> it. Uh, honestly, I don't think he's going to take the Zoo Flag Tower. Uh, because number one, it's further back. Number two, that's where I'll collapse everything back. And historically, uh, the Royal Engineers took him five times and uh, tons of dynamite to take out the Zoo Flag Tower. So, even though I might be dead at the end of this game, the Zoo Flak Tower will still be there. Yeah, I've, I've destroyed Chal's tanks on my right. I'm beginning to work away at Miles' tanks on, on my left. Uh, Miles is coming in the open, he's got a big force, but he's not going to have any saves in the open, so I think I might be able to whittle him down. A little bit concerned about dead ahead, there's a lot of infantry that Chal has. Uh, so we'll see, you know, if, if they keep making progress, they could get up close to the Reichstag, but I think I might be able to hold it. Well, the first three turns have seen some serious... Wait! Important announcement! Glorious leader Stalin! Berlin has fallen! I have captured Flak Tower and Control Tower! Not quite. <laughs> After some very, very difficult fighting in the early going, though, 
Tony and I are both making some really serious process, uh, progress. And I've now got what remains of, it, of my mauled armor forces as well as some infantry moving in on the victory column. And hopefully then I'm going to drive beyond that and get the exit off the opposite side of the board, though that one's probably going to be a little dicey. Still, I feel really good with where I am. I, like Steve, have suffered uh, some serious losses in uh, armor capability, but I've got enough forces here, I believe, to tie down the Germans in this area while I push towards the control tower and the objective off the board at that, at that road. No, I'm, that's, that's mine. Yes, yes, I'm supporting you. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, uh, it's been a bloody, uh, bloody day so far. I've uh, suffered what I consider to be uh, very significant losses. Um, the achievements aren't probably appreciable at this point. We have a, a one location. Two. Uh, all two, two locations. Um, but we're going to have to, uh, to really fight hard here to hold on to them. Chow's worst fears start to materialize on turn five. No longer content to hunker down inside the Reichstag, Simon aggressively sends his best SS troops out to counterattack in the Ministry District. The resulting battle is a ferocious, close quarters melee. The SS troops throw the Russians back and recapture one of the objectives on this half of the table. Chow and Miles are forced to retire for a quick water cooler conference to sort out how to respond to Simon's sudden counterattack. Over on the zoo flak tower side, Dave has largely conceded the middle of the table, leaving Steve free to consolidate around the victory column and organize a push deeper into the center. But Dave's strategy is a calculated gamble. By ignoring Steve, he focuses artillery and long-range tank fire against Tony with absolutely devastating results. Soviet casualties are horrendous, and Tony's battalions are forced to take morale tests, failing one after the other. This Soviet flank is now in tatters. On the opposite flank, Chow's forces in front of the Reichstag are not faring much better. But on this half of the table, Chow enjoys a much closer cooperation with Miles. Together, they mount a ferocious counterattack in the Ministry District, surrounding Simon's advance forces and pinching them off. Unable to fall back to the safety of the Reichstag, Simon's best units are encircled and pinned down. Nearing the end of the game, Miles and Chow have taken four of the five objectives on their half of the table. On the other wing, Tony and Steve control just two. And Dave is thinking about how he might be able to pry one of those two objectives away from the Soviets. If he can find a way, the Germans could pull off a narrow victory. So we've gotten to turn eight, and as you probably have seen, every single turn you pull cards for random uh, showing up units. And I actually got three small Volkssturm platoons. And you can put them anywhere on the board as long as it's outside of three inches. And there's a really nice cratered piece of terrain that I think is going to be perfect for them. And it overlooks the Victory Monument. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in there and they're going to come screaming out and hopefully it'll be enough firepower to kill that one or two last stands that I need to to maybe eke out a victory here for the Germans. It's now the final turn of the game, and the Soviets need to maintain their gains to hold on to the victory. Dave uses his Volkssturm pop-up units to mount a desperate counterattack at the victory column. Steve's infantry stubbornly hold on, but long-range fire from Dave's zoo flak tower and Simon's gun in the Reichstag suppress the Russian defenders in the open. On the very last shot of the game, the Volkssturm push the Russians back just far enough. It's literally a matter of inches to recapture the objective. We have failed to achieve victory. <laughs> we reached the end of uh, turn eight and a uh, hard fought battle. It came down to the very last turn and some of the last rolls, but the Russians were not able to achieve victory, at least on this day. I think uh, it's safe to say that everybody's game was terrible and they didn't enjoy it, which is kind of the whole point of the Battle of Berlin and how it was set up. So I think for me as a GM that at that in itself is a victory. So uh, with that in mind though, I do have little things that I intended to give away when I was gonna run this up at Little Wars in Chicago in April. 
has little uh, prizes for the 75th anniversary. So you guys will get yours Thank you. first. Thank you. But you die tomorrow. I thought it went well, better than expected. If I could do one thing differently, I was hoarding a lot of infantry in the Reichstag. I wish I had been more aggressive and charged out and, you know, just taken more victory points. That's my only regret. It did come down to that last battle and that last dice roll. Uh, unfortunately, we have to face the Russians tomorrow, which will not be so fun. <laughs> I always like when a game comes down to the final yeah. turn of the action. That, that tells you it's a really well-designed scenario and a real challenge for both sides. And that's what happened here. And unfortunately, uh, we came out the losers. Hello. Why was that, Tony? <laughs> well, the game ended on turn seven, at least for me. Um, we fought the battle in two separate battles when I could have probably shifted a few forces over to kind of support and, my good friend Steve. And to be clear, though, to be clear, on our side, we had four of the five locations yep. going into the final turn. And how many did we need to win? Uh, we needed five total. Really? Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Five total from both wards. Both, yeah. That's well, it's, it's funny you talk about the odds evening out. They didn't even out at our end, as Tony and I were just absolutely destroyed by Dave's artillery, turn in and turn out, and we couldn't land any of our own. So the fact that you know we were able to hold two objectives as long as we were, I thought was uh, pretty impressive. Yes, two objectives that became none. I held the church. <laughs> it did not become none. It was one.